Welcome back to another episode of the Mental Toughness Podcast. This is, of course, Matt Phillips, the founder of Pro Athlete Advantage, and very excited to be with you, as I always am, on these podcasts. Now, before I get into introducing the guest uh, for this week, I want to remind you of a few things. So first of all, if this is the first time you've ever heard this podcast uh, or learning about Pro Athlete Advantage, about me, Matt Phillips, um, I would love to connect with you on social media. So please go to our Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and connect with us. So we've got uh, some resources that will help grow your mindset, uh, grow your mental toughness, make sure you are approaching life as confident, focused, emotionally in control, and with as much energy as you need to perform your best. So we'd love to just to connect with you. So we can make sure and share all these resources with you. And so, frankly, I can hear your stories as well. I learn as much from, uh, you know, my, my team and, and my customers as they learn from me. So I'd love to connect with you as well. So connect with us on social media. A second thing I'll make you aware of very quickly is uh, that on May 15th and 16th of 2019, uh, we are launching the Shift Experience. It is a two-day event, a two-day experience. It's not. It's almost like the unconference. You've probably been to conferences before, uh, but we are creating an experience around your personal and professional development on taking this holistic approach to your mind, body, spirit, emotions, making sure that you are locked and loaded on growing not only your business or career, but every other area of your life. So I would love to have you at this experience um, as we shift your mindset and shift your life and shift your business. So go check out uh, experienceTheshift.io, experienceTheshift.io, and you can find out all the details about this two-day event that I am partnering on with Peter Lynch, another uh, culture and leadership expert uh, based here in Denver, a good friend of mine, and I guarantee you will not leave the same person. Uh, so excited for that. So go go check out experienceshift.io. So those are the two quick things I wanted to cover before getting into introducing today's guest. So I have a very special treat for you. It's actually Jim Underhill, the CEO of Cressa. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Cressa, you can go to cressa.com. Uh, they're a one of the leading commercial real estate firms in the world. And I had the opportunity to meet Jim a few months ago. They actually brought me in to do a speech with some of their top performing uh, producers in the company. And we talked about, uh, I talked about this concept of going all in, right? Of, of not, you know, holding back and kind of unleashing what you have in your business, but also every other area of life. And uh, Jim actually introduced me uh, right before my speech. So I got to speak with him a little bit. And there's certain leaders that you come across in life that you know you have to spend more time with. And Jim is one of those individuals. And I knew it literally the moment I shook his hand that I've got to I've got to learn more about, about him and about his background, about how he leads. I heard very good things from people that he worked with about his leadership style and where he was taking the company. And, and he's got, as you're going to hear, big visions for where he wants Cressa to go. Um, his quick background, um, he was a you know Washington and Lee University grad, went to Harvard to get his MBA. And he's got an extensive career with Trammell Crow Company, the Staubach Company. So he actually worked with Roger Staubach for you uh, Dallas Cowboy fans. Um, still very good friends with him. Uh, he was CEO of Americas for Cushman and Wakefield before, but almost three years ago now, uh, taking on the CEO role at Cressa. Uh, he is based out of Washington, D.C., and uh, again, it was just an absolute pleasure to get to, to meet with him and meet him uh, while he was in Denver before my speech. Uh, again, you know, leadership you start to hear certain themes of great leaders, but we're going to find out from Jim, which really stuck out to me is it's, it's about for him, like dreaming of this big vision of what could be, but then sticking to the action that is necessary to generate the results that you want. And that I just, I love talking to him about that and learning kind of who, who, uh, help develop him over the years, what he's learned. And I just know you're going to pull a lot from this interview with, Jim Underhill. So uh, get out your paper, get out your pen, get your, I don't know, iPhone or uh, Droid kind of ready to take notes. And let me introduce you to the one and only 
CEO of Cressa, Jim Underhill. Jim, thank you so much for taking your time. I'm excited to have you on the podcast. Uh, happy to be here with you, Matt, and uh, appreciate the invite. It, it was it was great because you and I met, gosh, probably two months ago at this point, two or three months ago. Time flies. Uh, and it was such a pleasure to get to speak uh, with some of your top producers, uh, you know, here in Denver when they all flew in from around the nation and from Canada as well. Um, and just appreciate you taking your time to uh, give me that intro uh, at that event before I spoke. And it's going to be, I'm very excited to get to know you a little bit better because we didn't get to spend a whole lot of time together uh, when you were here in Denver. Yeah, no, but it, was, it was obvious to me that you, you read our audience uh, quickly and, and well, and, <laughs> which uh, obviously is uh, important in the role you have and uh, equally important in the role that I have. And yes, and and I can't wait to dive into this because, you know, the business that you are in, uh, you know, part of my process in getting ready for that speech was actually to interview about four to five of of your producers uh, at your company who were going to be in attendance because I wanted to understand, you know, what they go through, what you know battles they're facing on a daily basis, where their mindset. Uh, lies. And that was so helpful for me in preparation um, of that meeting. Um, and I know your your history, which we'll dive into here in a little bit, is pretty extensive in that world as well from a, a commercial real estate perspective and as you've kind of climbed the ranks. Um, but before we dive into your background um, and me having some insight now, having spoken to your company and all that, um, you know, we talked a lot in that speech about mindset, about mental toughness. And where I wanted to start with you is, you know, when you hear mental toughness, like how do you define it? What kind of phrases, words come to your mind when you hear, when you hear those words? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a great term uh, because that may be what really defines uh, high performers and successful people, uh, not just in, in, in business life, but uh, I think in personal life, as well, and you know, the, word, the words that I associated with uh, would be like perseverance, uh, certainly having the uh, the discipline to take on the things that we know are hard. Uh, obviously, you don't, you don't need a whole lot of mental toughness to do things that are easy. That's that's what we gravitate to, and uh, and the like. But uh, I mean, as you said, in all things in life, both personal and and, and business, uh, we we all have have challenges, and to me. It is about bringing the discipline every day to make mm -hmm. sure that you're doing the things that uh, are most important to get done. Uh, mm -hmm. Very often, they are the hardest things to get done. Yes. And, and to sit in a leadership role, obviously, a big part of that is to set an example for others that they see it happening at the very top. That that you're ready to charge up the hill, and uh, yeah, we we've gotten knocked down a few times, but game on, let's go. And uh, I think that's a, a a key role of anyone in a in a leadership role is to provide that uh, example of mental toughness mm. on a day in and day out basis, and to be consistent about it. And those are gosh, that's a fabulous way to describe it. You know, one thing we you talk about that discipline piece which is massive, right? It's, it's, you know, that discipline around our thoughts, around our actions, around, you know, just what we're spending our time on on a daily basis. Cause you know, it's, it's value, right? Time, time is money, but time is value. Right. And that could be personally, professionally. Um, one thing you mentioned right before we started the podcast was what you do with your morning. And it sounds like you are pretty disciplined from, from the get go alarm goes off and, and you start that practice could you describe kind of what you do uh, to start your day off with that discipline? Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting that I actually read something recently about uh, some, some other author talked about what successful people do the night before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so probably a successful day begins with preparation the day or night before. And then one of the things was this, this laying in bed is they're thinking about the day they just had. And appreciating the good and uh, and what maybe they could have done better, but even setting the table for what what tomorrow they want it to be, and it's mm -hmm. almost like golfers getting that that visual image 
in your mind of, of, of where you want the shot to go. And I, yes. I, I think it helps for me waking up the next day knowing that these are the priorities. These are what's really important for me and not have to do that on the fly. Uh, mm. But for me, I, yeah, I've been doing it an awfully long time where it's, it's, a, it's an ingrained habit now, but I, you know, I wake up and I have, uh, I have my banana and I, I jump on a, a Stairmaster or a, okay. uh, an elliptical and, uh, and have a, a pretty good workout to start the day. And it uh, both gets me in a good physical uh, and, and mental framework. It gets, it gets the engine uh, fired up uh, pretty good. I know if I do that, then it, that, yeah, I last the whole day. Uh, that, I've tried you know, the midday, the late day routines and the like, but for me, it's important, particularly with the travel that I have, that mm. uh, I, I have an opportunity to take care of myself. And uh, sometimes we don't talk about that enough and it, it, it has a somewhat selfish overtone to it. But if we're going to be good leaders and good uh, husbands and fathers, we have to be willing to take care of ourselves physically, you know, mentally, spiritually, and all these other areas as well. So, and, and I love the, I love the routine. I'm, I'm a, you know, I have a lot of days I kind of mix up my routine, but I'm always doing something in the morning to start at least feel accomplished. Right. And then maybe working out, it could be, sure. you know, some spiritual work, things, a whole slew of different things. Was there a time in your career where you noticed that like it, that practice was truly important or have you had that consistent practice throughout like most of your career? Uh, I've had it most of my career, but I, I, there was a period where I was traveling a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I, 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 I knew that I, I needed that for just the physical, you know, the time zone recovery, uh, every everything that goes along with it. And it, it was interesting, Matt. I, when I was in in that period, I would grade myself at the end of every trip on three things. Like how, how well did I physically take care of myself and exercise? How well did I eat? Uh, what was my, my diet? And uh, did I have much to drink? And because mm -hmm. yeah, when you're out and everyone wants to go out and take you to a big steak place and get a couple of bottles of wine, then they, you know, you, I can't be the first guy to say, I gotta, I'm, I'm running, you know, running in. I need to be you know, out there with them. It's my one, sometimes my one chance a year to be with the, uh, important people in our organization or with clients. But that's another example of, of discipline. I haven't had uh, trouble on the last one in terms of drinking, but yes. clearly the, the diet and once you stop working out and you're not eating well, I would feel it at the end of a trip, just physically, just not feeling well. And, and it shows up in your mental performance mm. and energy level. So. I, love, I love that grading. Um, the physically, like what you ate, how you, how much you drank, things of that nature. One of the things I talk a lot about is like, how do we build these systems? How do we make sure that we don't fall off the track when we start traveling or traveling a lot? Is there, you know, what tips would you have for, for people out there listening who may travel a lot or have upcoming trips of ways that they can almost, I don't know, prepare themselves for, you know, you know, you're going to a, you know, dinner at such a place, how do you kind of say, you know, if I go to a place, then this is how I react. Do you have any big, any good tips that you have for that? Uh, I, I wish I did. Uh, probably the, the, the only one that really comes to mind is, is not uh, to let events uh, run on their own. And again, I have the luxury of being the CEO where I can say, CEO. okay, we yeah, dinner will start at this time, and and uh, I need to get back. I've got some work to do. Uh, it's when uh, you really don't have that opportunity, and uh, an evening turns into a lot longer, and uh, the food takes forever. And and it's, again, it's time is what we have, and it's time, time and energy. And uh, to me, it's uh, it's making sure that we use the limited hours that we have really well, and. Again, I, I look at the time when you're, we're traveling is we do it for a reason is because we're, we know we're better being in front of people than trying to do work through email and then over the phone all the time. And I try to have uh, high impact uh, engagement 
uh, with the people uh, I'm with. And again, I, you, you'll, you'll probably, you're, you're, you've heard this enough already probably out of me in this podcast, but I apply those same things to my personal life. And we talk about you know, you know, all the time about being present with your children and, and the like. And it's, it's important that we, we bring that discipline to all facets of the life. And I, and I think if, if that's part of what you do from a travel standpoint, there's, there's scheduling you can put around it to make sure that you're, you're, you're proactive and controlling your time and what you're doing versus just being along for the ride and having others dictate it. So that's probably the best advice I'd have. Yeah, I love that. I love that. It's, yeah, it's that saying, you know, luck favors the prepared. And I don't know if you want to stay physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, personally, professionally engaged. It's all about how are you, how, how planned are you? Um, and I like the word you used, kind of that proactive and staying in control of what you can control. Um, that's, that's great advice. The, you know, as you look back, is there, and there's probably a lot, and these are always loaded questions I ask, but is there one person in particular that sticks out that has just had like a, a massive influence on you? Um, you know, from a, from a business perspective uh, and also a personal perspective, maybe it's two different people. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yes. And, and the answer for me would be two different people. Uh, clearly on a, on a, on a personal uh, level, uh, it would be my father. And uh, he was uh, successful uh, through hard work. And, uh, uh, but he, he, he was one who was, was quiet about how he went about what he did. And I never, you know, never heard him brag and the like. And it just, I think I saw the, the, the discipline, humility, uh, and, uh, you know, appreciation for uh, the opportunities he was given in his life. So I, I think those things set my, my, my compass in a, in a good way, uh, getting started. And then uh, on a professional level, I had the, the good fortune of being partners with uh, Roger Staubach for, 15 years, uh, very early on in the formation of, of his real estate company and opened up the first office for him outside of Dallas, which was naturally where, where he lived. Yes. And, uh, yeah, and, and I think, you know, I saw, you know, a, a person who, uh, practiced high values, uh, in their business engagements. It was about doing the right thing. Uh, standing behind your word, and we're, we're in the professional services business. We we rely on our people to do great work. Uh, we we train them as as best we can and the like. But at the end of the day, uh, they're out there engaging with with people you know, representing us uh, and not just themselves. And I think to have high standards for your people and for and for them to know that we're all accountable to each other. We're not just a collection of individuals, but we've got a a real responsibility to each other. Uh, That's important and we need to honor that. And, and, and Roger was great about that. And there were, there were people that he got rid of who were very significant producers in the firm because uh, the term he would use was their destructive achievers. Now they may be highly productive on paper, but they are, either a cancer in the organization or undermining the brand because they weren't of the same character uh, as what we were trying to be to others. So it's, it stayed with me through my career. I think it's, it's, it's clearly part of the, uh, the Crescent DNA. Uh, yes. We live by doing the, the right thing. And, uh, and I think it's, a, it's a, maybe the most important role that I have as the CEO is to, to set you know, that compass and example for our people of who we are, what our culture stands for, and what those expectations are of everyone. Those are two great examples. And, you know, when you, one, one thing I find really interesting about just like the influences of, of people around us um, growing up and, and all that is there's, there's good and bad with everything, right? So humility, as an example, can be taken as, well, you have to be quiet, right? Um, and so you can take them either way. Um, 
whether it's a positive or negative or cock, you know, confidence can be seen as cockiness, right? Too much confidence can be uh, construed uh, perhaps in the wrong way. So when, you know, as you kind of progressed in your career and, and where you sit now, how do you balance out kind of the, like the humility versus confidence versus speaking up versus being quiet? Have, have you, is that something that, you've had to focus on or is it something that's come natural to you of like that delicate balance that has to happen like you and Roger having to let people go in the firm who were those cancers and speaking up and not just saying no this is we're, we're setting the tone it's going to be different and we have to take action from it you know, it's, it's, it's a great question I'm uh, I think first and foremost you have to be true to yourself and not try to be someone you're not and I, uh, you know, I can, I can, I can fire up the engines and uh, actually I've got to give a, you know, a speech every now and then to our people. And clearly there, there are people better at that than I am, but the feedback I get is, is uh, I'm, I'm genuine. It, it's obvious that I believe 1000% in what we're doing that I believe in our vision, our strategy. And yeah, I, I, I don't, it, at, the, at the highest level, I don't feel as though I'm selling anything either to mm -hmm. our people or to clients. It's, uh, I've got a story to tell. I, I, I wake up, I'm excited every day because I, I really believe we're on a, in a, a trajectory that will be great for our people. I think we're carving a place in the industry that's exciting and I love being with David in the David and Goliath thing. We got some big competitors out there and game on. Let's, let's go. Uh, yeah. And I think our people, people see that. Uh, yes. So it's to me, to me, my advice to anyone is, is it's, it's not uh, how energetic one can sell uh, or convey messages. It's, it's how genuine and passionate they can be. Uh, based on what they believe in. And I've, I've had points in my career, I'm sure you have too, Matt, where you're in situations where you just didn't, didn't quite believe as much about the company as uh, we have other situations that we've been in, including the one I'm in now. And, yes. and I, I, I can't BS people. Uh, mm. I, I, think, I think everyone appreciates honesty. Yes. And, uh, and we, hey, we were all here for the downturn, and it was that was pretty rough. And people, people want to know that you know we, you know we've, we're taking some lumps right now. We've got a, we've got a plan. We're going to work through this. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's part of it's stylistic, but I think also it's it's a uh, it's just a, a key leadership trait that you you just have to be honest with your people. You have to be honest with yourself. And if you if you do if you do that, I think there's a credibility that comes through regardless of your delivery style yes well i think that's i was just talking this yesterday the day before with someone about about that exact thing of like just leading with passion and telling your story and i was recalling that was a massive shift in my in my business with profit advantage when i finally came to the realization that my job is not to sell. My job is to share something I'm passionate about, to your point, to share my story. And with the understanding that sometimes people are going to like what I talk about, and sometimes, you know, perhaps they won't, or perhaps it's the wrong timing. I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, situations outside of my control. But nine times out of 10, when I lead with that passion and just tell people what I'm excited about and how I can help, um, it generally leads to like a great conversation or maybe down the line, it leads to a, you know, a speech or something, but it, that was a massive shift for me of that authenticity and, and that passion and just making sure it comes out in every single situation um, that I had. So I, I love that. That was a massive shift in my business. Yeah. And it's, uh, I think it takes a maturity uh, that quite just comes partly with years and experiences to recognize that being yourself is okay. It's more than okay. And that's, 
that's really what uh, what people want to, to see in here. So how, because it's great, you know, again, I, I'm the same as you. It's like I lead with passion, right? That's why I got so excited for what I do and, uh, you know, doing speeches that, that I did at Cressa was, um, I was so excited afterwards, um, and let alone during the speech. And, you know, we all lead with that passion. We get excited and sometimes, you know, deals don't close, right? Or timing is off and we're faced with, you know, the, the failure, right? Which is inevitable in, in, the, in the Cressa business and the commercial real estate and what I do every, every part of life, right? You're going to experience those failures. How have you personally kind of, I don't know, dealt with that in the past or continue to kind of lean on that passion to just to keep going when the, when things got tough? Well, the, 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 the passion has to be uh, coming from a, a deep rooted conviction uh, in what I'm doing. Uh, as, as, you, as you said, the, you know, the, the setbacks are, are going to come. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, to me, the, the important thing is if, if, you, if you really you know you're on the right path, you're doing the right things, uh, that you, know, you, you dust yourself off and you, uh, you say, okay, let's, let's keep, keep going. Uh, doesn't mean that you don't change course uh, along the way. Uh, markets are changing, world's changing around us, kids are getting older, you know, with the message when they were six, mm -hmm. not the same one when they're 14, <laughs> they will we'll listen to. Uh, but no, I, I think uh, it, it, it's, it really is important that you, you've got that uh, belief as your foundation. Mm. And, uh, and, a lot, and a lot of it also matters, as you know, it's, it's, it's who you surround yourself with, too. And when you've got the right team uh, around you, and I know that's one, one of your key messages as well, yes. is they, they, will, they will lift you up. Uh, they'll make you better. Uh, we should all be doing that for each other. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if, if you don't have the right, right team, either from a, a skill level or the most more importantly, from a commitment level to each other, it's, it's a weight on an organization that I think just drags it down uh, to a degree where dealing with the, uh, the bumps in the road or even just achieving over the, you know, your aspirations and potential, it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, and that's, uh, that may be the, the trickiest part of, of business it is the fine art of bringing teams of people of different skill sets different different backgrounds uh to be aligned around a common goal uh that's greater than themselves so it's uh, clearly having having that support group and uh, shared inspiration around you is is you know, a critical part of how we manage through those uh, downturns. Do you have a kind of board of advisors or group that you go to even outside of, obviously you have one within Cressa, uh, but outside of, you know, your current company that you rely upon? Uh, I, I did previously uh, through YPO, Young Presidents. Mm, yes. And, uh, and that was a great, Great group. I have uh, I've since graduated from YPO. Uh, no longer in the uh, the, the young you know. part. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've, I've I'm fortunate. I've got some some good friends who uh, fulfill that role in a, in a different way. They're just they're more, they're more just good friends. And uh, one runs a private equity company. Another one has a, a business a consulting business and the like. And I know they've got similar challenges and uh it's it's a it's, it's a group where there's uh, there's there's no risk of uh of any any question you 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 ask or say i mean friends love it when you say i could use your help mm, yes you know? and I'm, I'm i'm blessed that i've got you know people around me who uh, who want to give me some help uh on those occasions. So yeah, I think it's important because particularly in a leadership role, as I say, it's a, it's a little, it's a little lonely at the top and, and some of the things that, that, that I need to think about, uh, I need to go externally 
Yes. And a board, a board is not, you want to bring solutions to a board uh, more than some of the, maybe the dilemmas that I might share with uh, other people. Yes. No, that makes, that makes perfect sense. I remember my uncle told me a story once he went to the board and uh, he, he didn't drive the conversation. He let them drive it one time and he said, I will never make that mistake again. Um, <laughs> so it just opens you up to, uh, to some interesting comments and questions. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's wild. Are you, you know, at Cresta, maybe some of your past companies, have you, because one of the big things is like, I think that holds people back is almost this uneasiness um, of like, how do I find, you know, those people, right? How do I find, you know, mentors, the big thing, you know, being thrown around at companies, these, all these mentor programs are popping up left and right. Um, and at, at its core, it's like, you know, surrounding yourself with good people to help you with whatever you're dealing with. And is that, you know, these mentor programs or, or, uh, you know, the like, are they a big kind of, do you have a big push at Cresta for those? Have you had them at, at different companies? And whether or not you did, I mean, what advice would you give the people who are looking for kind of those mentors, those people? Because I think it can be an intimidating thing to go find people to discuss your issues with. Yeah, I, I think it depends on the type of mentoring uh, one might need. I, I, I look at, when I look within our organization at people who are in prime developmental stages, mm -hmm. whether they're you know, somewhat new in the business or they're, or they're getting their legs, uh, but they are ready to take a, a big step forward. I, I think mentoring is the most important uh, support vehicle and developmental vehicle we can give them. Mm -hmm. a, a, a human being who can say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And we, we tried to do that within our offices. Uh, we have found some of the best mentoring is when it's not someone they see on a regular basis. It could be someone uh, in another service line than theirs, uh, but just brings a different perspective. And yes. we've also looked at having mentors in other offices, uh, which has challenges because you, you can't have the face-to-face. -face. Yes. But if it can be sort of a, a second level of mentoring, uh, it can just add another perspective that'd be meaningful. So in that, in that respect, I, I think it's, it's vitally important in a professional services firm to lift our, our younger or early stage people to a higher level. Part of what I think you're, you're mentioning Matt, is, 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 is again with these advisory group CEO ones that are popping up, I actually had a conversation with someone last week, another one. And, yeah. uh, I, I think they can be good. Uh, that may be just even a another business you can look at as advisory on all these different CEO groups and who, to, who to, which is the right one for right. or what you are looking for because I I have a hard time figuring out which ones really would serve various purposes, whether it be for me or other people in my leadership team, or other uh, folks. Yeah. But, yeah, I think having resources outside your day-to-day -day work are, are helpful, whether it is a, you know, friends, colleagues, or those yes. groups. Uh, when I, I think the right ones can be very beneficial. Yes, and I, I think it's what you said, right? Right at the beginning, um, you made a comment about how, you know, people are willing to help. And that's human nature. And I, I think this whole mentor concept has almost got intimidating where it's like I have this, this formal agreement I have to enter into when at the end of the day it's, it's like listen this is a person who's providing a different perspective on whatever you might be dealing with and if you could take his or her advice and perspective and do with it what you will um, it can benefit you in big ways so don't overthink it just research a little bit find them try things you know see what see what works best for you yeah, I think, I think one, one of our challenges just as human beings is we, we find comfort in repetition. It's both good and bad. It's good when it's about getting up in the morning and working out. It's bad when it relates to how would we problem solve and we approach things thinking the same way. Yes. And, and obviously that's, we, we talk about it uh, here about 
it's, it's one of the reasons why diversity and inclusiveness is so important. It's not just to make a statement, but we talk about, I think, I think we're better at what we do for our clients when we have a, we bring a diverse group of people and backgrounds and experiences and viewpoints to problem solving than five people that went to the same type of college and university and socioeconomic background and race and everything else. Mm -hmm. so yeah, you know, I think getting uh, us to uh, getting us exposure to people that have other perspectives and backgrounds makes us better. And if you're not uh, intentional and proactive about doing that, I think we, we tend to reside in the same lane. And there are limitations. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, some of the mastermind groups I run, um, I have a variety of different people that are all highly driven. So very similar, like my ment mentality and drive, but from a variety of different businesses and backgrounds. And I find that's the most fun thing because, you know, uh, I've got, I joke, I have Willy Wonka in one of my, um, mastermind groups. He's a president of a chocolate company. And, uh, and, so when Willy Wonka is bringing us chocolate, but you know, that him compared to, you know, a person who's running a consulting business, vastly different uh, businesses, but they're there to serve others, just different products, but the perspectives they bring where the, you know, they'll look at each other's businesses and be like, well, well, you're way, you're way overthinking, the, you know, simplify it. Think about it from this perspective and this light bulb you can see across the room goes off um, with that other person. It's amazing to watch those wow. different backgrounds. You need to get some lazy people in that group. So I know, right? More diversity, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, we uh, yeah, we sit around and eat chocolate the whole time, and we'll we'll get lazy soon enough, Jim. Yeah, I think so. That's wild. Um, so you know, life is full of kind of these defining moments for us, right? And they happen, you know, when we're young. They happen in our career. They happen at home. All different you know, places where they pop up. Um, I'd love to ask you, like, what's one kind of defining moment in your life and, and how has that impacted you and, and perhaps made you into the person you are today? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I, 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 there's not one that just jumps out and says this was a co complete life changer, but I, yeah, I, I, I'd have to say I, I was uh, at a point in my career um, and was five, six years out of business school, was working for uh, Trammell Crow Company, which was one of the like top 100 uh, most admired companies, uh, was a partner and on a tremendous career path. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was, uh, my, my dad had passed away. I was in Dallas. I grew up on the East Coast in, in New York. And, you know, it was, it was one of those, that I just, you know, I said, you know, my, my heart and soul was telling me, I, you know, I need to get back closer to home. Um, mm. I, I just, yeah, it, and that's when I actually met Roger Staubach. And that's, and he had his office in Dallas where, where I was, was living. And it was a, the right thing at the right time. But, uh, I was uh, engaged at the time. Okay. A little more weight to the decision, uh, but I, you know, I, I said, you know, I, I, I want to make this move. I'm going from a, a most admired, established company to I'm going to go open up an office uh, in Washington with a bride to be uh, in Redskin territory where they really don't like Roger a whole lot. <laughs> Right. <laughs> no, he, he and I still laugh about that. That was of all the markets to open up in, that might have been, you know, the, the last one we should have looked at. But, exactly. But Take it, on a challenge. Here we go. Yeah, but it, but it's and there have been other points in my life where this it, it's where I felt I I had to be true to myself. And when when something says you know, I'm I'm ready to do something different and make a move for whatever reason, uh, and leaving a very secure, promising uh, situation for one that had a, had a pretty significant amount of, of risk. 
but that I felt was the right thing for me personally and from a family respect uh, and the like was one I, I look back on today. And fortunately, it all worked. It worked, it worked out with Roger the rest of my career. My wife still loves me. So, I'll, you know, all those, <laughs> <laughs> all those, all those things, uh, you know, sort of came out with a, a happy ending. Uh, but it's change is hard and it's hardest when things are, are pretty good. Uh, and again, for me, it was not because I was going to make more money or, or something tangible I could point to, but it was, uh, just sort of, sort of in, in, in my heart uh, about getting back closer to home and being able to help mom and, uh, and be in a, a situation that I thought was entrepreneurial. And, uh, and for me, I've, I've loved building things. I knew that much about myself and uh, whether through summer jobs, I, I'm, I'm not a good employee. I, okay. <laughs> I'm a lot better when I have a, a chance to uh, be entrepreneurial and, and build things. And, and that's the other part of what I saw. I said, you know, this feels like this could be a, a really exciting thing for me where I can have an impact. And quite frankly, that's why I'm at Crescent now too. This is, I, I saw this as a, a, a similar opportunity of a company that's got a fabulous foundation, this with some leadership and capital, that it, this could really be uh, a, a fun ride. And that's, that's what it's been. And, uh, but we, we have to be willing to take those chances, uh, at least for me personally, you know, yes. my, my DNA to be satisfied and, and excited with what I'm doing. I love that. The, yeah, first of all, yeah, my, my father passed away about, oh gosh, four years ago, just over four years ago on November 8th, which is crazy. And that was one of the big things was he was going through his battle with cancer. Um, it was me taking that internal look of like, what do I want and what adventures am I willing to take on? Um, and what's truly important and, kind of that legacy. And that's why that was a big, big piece of me starting my business um, and, and continue to grow it. So I love hearing stories about that, how that we, we have those opportunities, I think, many times in life, but to look inside and be like, what do we want? And what's, what's best for me right now and my family? And, and where am I fulfilled as well? So it's really fun because you came from an entrepreneurial environment, but the fact that you get to go you know, move out with, with Roger and team and not with him, but like go to go start that office, just a completely different level of building something. And I can tell your excitement with Cressa too, of just in your voice, you hear you talking right now of how excited you get about building this and the opportunity and the vision, um, which you talked about earlier. Yeah. What, what was the, what was one of the most difficult things like starting the office that, that you encountered? Uh, well, again, it was, it was a complete startup and, uh, I think, I think having, having no clients, no, nothing with me and I hired a, a bad assistant. That was probably the first, <laughs> the first <laughs> challenge. And then, uh, I, I did remind Roger, I saw him recently that, that, uh, the, uh, the company sent up two people from Dallas to help me and I learned later on there were two people they were thinking about getting rid of. Instead, they sent them away <laughs> to Washington and uh, it actually worked out with them okay. And uh, the like, but it's, I'll, I'll never forget. I mean, it's when you're starting a business, your first client is a, a breakthrough. And I'm sure for you with yours as well. I'll, no, I'll never forget it. It was a, a uh, guy, Barry Muse, national security analysts, and he had a, a small office uh, outside Washington, and and he he hired me and and us, and mm -hmm. I had never done a deal representing a tenant like his. I had you know particularly in Washington had moved up from 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 Dallas, and you know I was I was selling you know snow to the Eskimos, and mm -hmm. but it was one of those where if yeah, I think you could tell that I, I believed in what I was doing. I, I, I did have great training. I knew, I knew real estate, so there wasn't an issue there. But when you don't have a resume, it's, it's, it's really tough. But when the, that first one said, I want you to help me, uh, and I'll, I'll never forget it. 
It's, uh, it was one of the most exciting drives back to the office I've ever had, even though it was a small deal. And then the, from there, it just seemed every, everyone got easier. And, uh, and he became one of my best references for years. Really? Um, yeah. And so, it's, as we said, you know, we, 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 we build these, uh, these things one brick at a time. Yes. And uh, it all has to be off of a, a really good foundation. But, you know, the hardest part for any entrepreneur is, is, is getting started and uh, getting others to believe that yes. what you're doing is, uh, has real value to it. Yes. So, yep. I love that. Yeah, I love those stories of the first, the first clients. I remember mine as well. It's, uh, yeah, the, those key, key pivotal moments where they're etched in your brain forever. Um, and you keep going back to, especially when the, when the going gets tough. The, um, a couple more questions. I want to be obviously cognizant of your time, uh, Jim, and just so appreciative of you taking, taking your time uh, this afternoon. Um, what's one thing that, kind of keeps you up at night now like what 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 are some of your i don't know concerns or the areas you're focused on right now yeah it uh today today it's it's uh, it's interesting i, I joined cressa about two years ago mm-hmm. and, and the company's been around for 30 years mm-hmm. and is i inherited a, a company that uh, has found its way to be the largest pure tenant advisory firm in the world. Uh, and, but I think the opportunity for the firm is so much greater than what people who've been here 20 years and have built it have seen. That getting people to reimagine the company that they've been part of for, again, 20, 25, 30 years for some of them, uh, is uh, and, and 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 not to have them feel as though I'm trying to break what they have built. Yes. But to make it better, and it's a it's a classic change management. And part of it is if we're going to go from where we are today to a, a real not, not just powerhouse, but I don't. I see us as the, the most highly respected real estate advisory firm in the world. And that mm-hmm. is an aspiration. And I think it's the, 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 the foundation is there. Uh, and so it's, again, it's, it's changing course to some degree. Uh, but it's, uh, I think, uh, and the term I've used actually in some of my comments to, to people is, I think our uh, our potential is greater than our aspirations, mm. and, uh, I, and that's and, but that's it. That's a, it's a good thing. If that's if that's the biggest thing that I have to fix, then I've been blessed. Yes, uh, there's there's nothing broken. It's just I see so much potential. I hear clients saying, "Boy, if, if you could do this for us in all of these markets around the world, or if, if you would think about getting into this business." And so I lay in bed and my, my brain's racing about mm-hmm. how do we prioritize the things that we do that we, you know, there's a, uh, an evolutionary process here that's, that's logical, thoughtful. It's, it's uh, taken risk factors into account appropriately, but at the same time, it's, it's ambitious, it's exciting. And uh, you know, we get to live in this wonderful world once. And I, I have to say, I, 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 I see what we can do, and to me, it's getting, getting uh, everyone else uh, in, the, in the boat with me. Right. And I feel good about uh, uh, where that's gone already, and, and again, I think you can tell. I, I believe in it, and I think I've got, a, I've got a pretty full boat right now. I think people are pretty excited about what we're doing, and uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's really not an issue, but it's, it was probably – the biggest change for us in yes. an organizational reimagination that uh, was, was vital for us to achieve our potential. Well, that's huge. It's yeah. There get people to dare to dream a little bit more and bigger than they ever have before it can be a scary thing. But to your point with us, if you have the right skill set in place, which it sounds like you do and 
and I'll tell you through interactions that I had, even just, you know, during the 90 minutes I was with, with you and the team and, and uh, some, you know, follow on conversations that I've had with uh, some folks in the, you know, LA and New Jersey and, and Canadian offices. Um, I can tell, and I know uh, you've, you've got some really, really good people in place uh, who share that same vision and passion and drive. So what you, what you and team have built as I've been able to see firsthand is, is fabulous. Well, well th thank you. And uh, look, look forward to more engagements with you because we, uh, we can, we can uh, use some outside uh, advice and, and the like, and we can talk offline obviously about some of the, some of those things, but, uh, but no, it's, it's, uh, so it's all about people. And yes. I, I feel just very fortunate to, to be in the position I am right now. And, uh, Fabulous. So we're having a lot of fun. I, I know you are. And um, do you have time for one last question? Sure. Okay. Uh, I love throwing this one at you because as you can tell, I like these big open ended questions to make you think and, and then uh, we'll just see what bubbles to the top. But, uh, but last question for today is, you know, if you had one advice or one piece of advice to pass along, uh, whether it's, you know, your folks at Cresso, whether it's, you know, the, the listeners today as well, um, that would help them, you know, separate themselves from everybody else. Because, you know, when we talk, when I talk mental toughness and mindset, it's about how do we differentiate ourselves? How do we be different? You just talked about how Cresso, like you want to be different than your competition, right? You want people to view you differently. Um, what's one piece of advice you'd pass on to, to the, the folks listening today just so they can professionally, personally like stand out from everyone else? Well, uh, I, I think it is around the discussion of, of vision. And you know, the, the first part is, is letting people think boldly. And uh, we, had, we had a meeting uh, we did in Nashville about about a month ago, and uh, brought a somewhat impromptu group of people together. And mm -hmm. and, um, and my invitation to them was, you 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 only get to come to this meeting if you if you bring uh, two outrageous ideas about what we could be in five years. I said, don't show up w without it. And uh, and I said, I, I expect that. We, we will laugh at many of them, but that there may be just, if, if one nugget comes out of that uh, mm -hmm. meeting, then it'll been well worth the time. And, and it was that. It was a, a very creative uh, opportunity to have us discuss things uh, without any risk to anyone. The risk was if you weren't ambitious enough, mm -hmm. you're not gonna get <laughs> the next one. Uh, so, and, and so part of it is, is, is you, you have to think boldly or you're just like everybody else. You have to be, what will really make you, you different? What do you stand for? I mean, we talk about purpose and the like is, is what differentiates us? Because if we're just like everybody else, then, you know, sooner, then it's luck. You're going to turn into a commodity business and top people shouldn't be here. They should be going to a company that's got bigger ambitions. Clients will follow those, those people. So, so to me, it, it is thinking, thinking big. And then part B is, is, is committing to it. It's one, it's easy to talk about it, but when you commit, you, you, you start, you lay out an action plan and we've just gone through a five-year strategic planning process and we've pr broken it down into bite-sized pieces of you know, three phases. And we've got a lot of uh, measurable action items that we need to do. And that's where the rubber meets the road is accountability and, uh, and making sure that you are on a you know, day in, day out, taking the steps that you know you need to take to fulfill that objective. And you know, it's, that's the, you know, maybe the not so much fun part of yeah. our discipline and running a really good business. But it's it uh, what separates, uh, yeah. You know, I think the high performers from the dreamers. Yes. And, uh, and the third leg of that is just is having the right people around the table, like we talked about earlier. That either you know, if, if they're not if they're not committed, then they're going to you know, drag the whole thing down. 
So, uh, but you asked for one, I gave you three legs. To I listen. love it. <laughs> All vision, commit, and right people. So I, I love it. You, you gave me one stool. It just happened to have three legs. <laughs> you gave me one thing. That's good. Yeah. I love it. That's great advice. Well, Jim, I truly, truly appreciate your time today. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I need to spend some more time with you. So I'm going to have to fly out to D.C. just to, just to follow you around for meetings and, and learn from you and grow just by, uh, just by hanging out with you. Um, so thank you so much for today. Yeah, uh, the, the pleasure is mine, Matt. And uh, yeah, when you let me know when you can make it here, you'll you'll uh, you'll make us better. Uh, thank you. By being here. So thanks again, and we'll uh, look forward to the next visit. If you enjoyed the podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you could head over to iTunes or Stitcher and give us a rating or review. And as always, please don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and stay in touch. Have a fabulous rest of your day. Thank you.